I like to point out when I worked at the NSA, that was back before we spied on Americans. <laughs> or at least before we told everyone we did that. So, uh, yeah, when I was, I was there, I left in um, 2005, I think. And, uh, you know, they, were, they made a really big deal about not spying on Americans and you get in big trouble. And we had to do yearly trainings not to do that. And, uh, like, I left, and, like, within a year, there was all this stuff about how you know, they spies on Americans. And I was like, holy crap, like, I, I leave, and it just goes to hell. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it turned out that they were spying on Americans while I was there. They didn't tell me. I was upset. <laughs> anyway, so uh, uh, let's talk about InfoSec. So uh, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm actually a, a St. Louis native, so uh, I, I just drove in from my house today. Yeah, St. Louis. All right. <laughs> so thanks for coming, everyone who's not from St. Louis. Uh, welcome. Uh, I usually give, I give a lot of talks, maybe 20 or something. Uh, usually they're, they're more sort of technical talks about research I'm doing. Um, I do give a few keynotes, uh, but I'm probably not quite as good at keynotes as, as technical talks, so please uh, bear with me. Um, Mostly because I don't really know exactly what a keynote talk is about. Um, so from going to a lot of conferences, what I've sort of taken from it is, is that keynotes just sort of talk about whatever they want. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so one of the things that, that bugs me, and you know, I've been doing InfoSec for uh, 15 years or something. And it's, it's, it's a fun field. It's exciting. And you know. It's sort of adversarial, like there's bad guys and there's good guys, and you have to make sure that bad guys don't win. And so there's a lot of things that are, that's really fun about it, and you know, it can be technical or not technical. It, it's up to you. And, and so there's a lot of things I really like about it, but having done it for 15 years, like I feel like it's like, like I don't know, like, uh, like are, are, are we doing this right? Like have we totally screwed up? Like are we better off now than 15 years ago? And so that's kind of what this talk is about, um, and uh, definitely. Uh, feel free to, if you, if you think I'm saying something that's not true or, you know, you, you totally agree or whatever, just feel, feel free to interrupt. I, I won't mind. All right, so uh, it was a great introduction. Uh, just some more stuff about me. Uh, I've done a bunch of mobile security. Uh, I won this contest called Ponone four times, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, this is a contest where uh, if you can break into a computer or a phone or something that's, like, fully patched, then you win the actual device and, and some money as well. That's why it's like pwn, like hack, pwn to own. So anyway, I won this thing like four, four times. Uh, I wrote a few books. Uh, lately, I've been doing a bunch of like car hacking. So um, I, that, that's like a lot of fun. Uh, and then I have some, some letters after my name. So all right, so this is basically when I talk to people who aren't in the field, and I say, I do computer security, or I'm a hacker, or whatever. Uh, this is what they think of is, is articles like this, which obviously, um, you know, it's hard it's hard to compete. I mean, for I mean, look at this. This is a, this is an article I got from something like reasonably new in the computer, and it's like a 386 or something. Like, <laughs> you know, it's bull just looking at that. But anyway, not everyone knows it's bull. So uh, the question that I was sort of asking myself when I was putting these slides together is like, are we really better off now than in 2007? And I chose 2007 as sort of an arbitrary time frame based on that's when I started to kind of give talks at conferences. Um, but you could choose any time you wanted. Um, so, so here are talks from uh, Black Hat, which is a big conference. Uh, you know, some would say the biggest industry conference uh, for, for computer security. Um, some of these talks, and you can tell by the font, which are, which are grouped together. Um, some came from Black Hat in 2007, and some came from Black Hat in 2013, so last year's version. Um, and if you read through them, it's, it's not obvious to me which are which, right? Uh, so on the one side, you've got things like database forensics, understanding the heat by breaking it, static detection of application backdoors. Like, are those things that we cared about seven years ago and, and solved, or are these things that we care about now and are trying to solve? Um, and then on the other side, there's some SQL injection kind of talk uh, CSRF attacks and, and things about PDF exploits. Like again, like are those the ones that we've solved because we talked about seven years ago, or are these the ones we still care about? So anyone want to guess which which side, right or left, are the ones from now from the conference this year? Anyone have a guess? Right side, someone said. Anyone else? He says left side. So he, it's hard to tell, but it's actually the right side is the newer the newer talks. So it's like. 
Like, why are we giving talks at conferences if seven years later we can't even tell whether we've improved, right? It's kind of depressing. And then, of course, the, the, the gold standard in computer security is, uh, you know, uh, as to whether we're doing a good job is whether people are getting breached and, and losing their data. And if you look at, at, at the number of breaches we've had, and I didn't even include Target, um, there, there is uh, really not a whole big difference between what was happening in 2007 and what was happening now. And so uh, half of these, the, if you know your history well, you'll know which two. Half of these came in 2007, half of these came last year. And again, like, so we're still getting breached. So by that measure, we're not doing that great a job. Here's two uh, things I've taken off of the Microsoft site. So in not picking on Microsoft, I just, they had good data. So I, I, I went with them. So on the, on the left, uh, I won't even make you guess here because one says Internet Explorer 7 and the other one says Internet Explorer 8, I think. So, so you would know. But anyway, on the left is from 2007, uh, a monthly patch update from Microsoft. And these are all... Uh, remote code executions in Internet Explorer. On the right is taken from uh, sometime in the last year. Uh, again, all code executions in Internet Explorer. Okay, like, so we have a new browser. We have, you know, SDLC. We have fuzzing. We have all this stuff. Um, but we still have a non-trivial amount of bugs uh, being patched in Internet Explorer. So are, are we doing good or not? Um, this is something that, uh, so, you know, maybe though we're not doing better, but at least we understand what we're doing. I don't know. So, so if you look at like headlines and, and what reporters are reporting on our field. Uh, so on the left, iPhone flaw lets hackers take over. And then on the right, your TV might be watching you. So are, are either of these more or less scary or frightening and actually not even important to our lives as security professionals? Uh, well, I would say they're both probably not very important to, to protecting our, our customers or our, our students, our professors, or whatever. Whoever your job is to protect, probably doesn't matter either of these two headlines, but this is what everyone cares about. Um, and then I actually, uh, I covered up the right side of that picture on the left one because it's got my face on it. So that's actually <laughs> something I, I caused that headline, um, even though I'm saying that you shouldn't worry about it. All right, so... so uh, Again, like it, it, you know, to me, it's like depressing that you can't tell the difference. Like nothing has changed since 2007, as far as these sort of eye-popping headlines. Um, I mentioned this contest. It's you know, it's every year. These these security researchers get together. They try to break into a fully patched system. Uh, so maybe this is a way to judge, you know, which systems are, are more secure or less. Which ones are harder? Are things getting better? Like so, maybe in 2007, you know, we were able to do it, and now we can't do it anymore. It's too hard. Well, in 2007, uh, Mac hacked via Safari browser and phone known contest. 2013, like Chinese security team exploits Safari security flaw. So exactly the same thing happens every year. So every year we have the contest. Every year, all the things get hacked. Like, are are we improving? Like, it, by that contest, you can't tell if we are or not. Um, the only difference is it took one guy in 2007 and a team in 2014 or 13 or whatever that was. Um, so. Like, I'm depressed. Like, <laughs> I don't really, you know, I don't really know what, you know, it, our, you know, we work hard and we try to protect our users and I, as a researcher, try to, uh, you know, help. But are, are we making a difference? So, so the sort of thing that I think about is, and, and this is sort of in, in fits of, 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 you know, depression, is... Like, one of the things you learn from all this is no matter what you do, like, you can always get hacked, right? So whether, whether you, you spend a million dollars on your budget and you've got this huge team and you're doing everything right, no matter what you do, still it can happen, right? And then you've got some people who aren't really doing almost anything and they still might get hacked too. And it's kind of hard to tell from the outside which of these two happens, right? So you read about Target or in St. Louis there was, there's this grocery store called Schnucks and they got hacked. And people ask me, like, oh, those guys are idiots, right? They, they totally got hacked. And I was like, you can't tell. Like, they might have been doing everything really, really well and did everything right, and they just got, you know, they got hacked anyway, right? Or they were completely ignoring the, the problem, and they got hacked because they were totally negligent. And from the outside, there's no way you can really tell. And um, basically, like, the reason I got into computer security is because I thought it was, like, fun and, and you know, interesting. 
Um, which is why I was hired at NSA actually not to do computer security, but to do math, which is what my, my background said. And I was like, nah, this computer hacking stuff, this looks way more fun. And so now I'm, I'm at the point where I don't think it's really that fun anymore because if you're a defender, it's like no matter what you do, you can still get hacked and you know, lose your job or, or look bad or whatever your, your biggest fear is. Like that can still happen. Like I work at Twitter and my job is to try to not make sure Twitter doesn't get hacked. And you know, I, I'm doing my best, but there's no guarantee that tomorrow they're not gonna get hacked, right? And um, likewise for you guys. So as a defender, it's not very much fun because no matter how hard you try, the people on the outside can't really tell how hard you're trying and you can still get hacked. And from an attacker like me, someone who does research and wants to find out, you know, find new interesting flaws or write exploits or whatever, like it's not even that fun either because um, now I, I hack a car or I hack, you know, the, the latest version of Chrome and it's like, what do people say about that? It's like, oh yeah, that, you know, I'm not surprised everything can get hacked. So, well, yeah, I know, I know everything can get hacked, but still it's like, you know, it's hard and... <laughs> So, so anyway, the, the, it's not fun for anyone anymore, and, and it's sort of a bummer. So this is why when I go to conferences, I do this usually instead of going to the talks. This is, this is, this is me at Black Hat last year. All right, so um, what else, is, what else is, is wrong with our industry? So uh, a lot of people, you know, their, their main job, and maybe some of you, is to make sure that your, your network or, or your, 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 your whole area is compliant to something you know, PCI or whatever you happen to need to be compliant to. And um, as we've seen from, like I said, the gold measure isn't how many IDS boxes you have or how many, you know, what brand firewall you have. The real measure at the end of the day is whether you've been broken into or not. And um, if you use that as a measure, compliance is not helpful at all. So if you look at Mandiant, which is this company, good company that to, to call in if you ever get hacked. Um, so they, they help out people, figure out what happened, recover, that sort of thing. And uh, they're a very large company. Every single person that they helped in 2013 was PCI compliant at the time of, of their break-in. So like obviously compliance didn't help them. All right, so compliant is some, some really low bar that you have to at least meet, but it, it obviously isn't, isn't gonna keep out everyone because here, here's proof that compliance doesn't mean that you're gonna get hacked or not get hacked. Um, everyone like loves to pick on Target, and you know you can say, well, Target was totally incompetent, but they were PCI compliant. So by that measure of security, they were fine. And then the worst thing is, uh, you know, you, you think, you know, I, I talk about like no matter how hard you try, uh, how great a job you do, you can always get hacked. I say that, but like the types of people who can attack you at that point, there's not quite so many, right? They have to be pretty advanced or lucky or something. Um, and if you don't do much, then sort of anyone can hack you. But the, the, the sad thing is if you look at this study that says like two-thirds of, of people who successfully attack um, websites do it just for kicks, right? Um, so that means that it was so easy that they could just do it as a hobby for fun, right? And it's, it's like, oh, come on. Like at least, like if you're, if you're going to attack me, be like China or something. Don't be just some kid who's bored. And then uh, the thing that's my, one of my personal uh, things, you know, I'm, I'm more or less a professional bug finder. So I, look, I audit code, I you know, look for bugs, I write exploits. Even in, during my research, I'm looking for problems. So one of the things that really drives me crazy is that you know, 15 years later, seven years later, however you want to count it, like, we still can't find bugs in software. We don't know how to, how to flush out all the bugs. And so here's like the worst proof ever. So there's this, uh, you know, most Linux uh, say desktops for sure. Anything that has a window manager has this thing uh, called, uh, you know, the, the X window manager. And uh, there was this flaw found in 2013 in it that would allow local users to elevate their privileges to that of root. And if you look in the, the highlighted part, you, you probably can't read it. I'll read it to you. It says, "This bug appears to have been introduced in the initial RCS version 1.1 checked in on May 10th, 1991." <laughs> This bug is like 25 years old. It's been, it's been in like every Linux distribution for 25 years, and we never found it. Um, I mean, what are you going to say about that, right? And and I've personally looked at X of, of a different version, maybe, but uh, you know, for for bugs. So it's like people are looking for bugs in this, and you know, it's open source. Anyone could have looked at the the source code. We didn't find it. Like, how how can we expect to secure, um, you know? 
our web browser or our email client or anything if we can't find this bug in 25 years. So, uh, like, why do we suck? Um, basically, one of the main issues is that no matter how good you are, at, if your job is to protect your enterprise or your university or whatever, um, you're sort of at the mercy of all the products that you use. So, uh, and, and these products that we use are, are essentially insecure. Um, and the reason, and I'll get in a little bit more about this. So the reason that these products are insecure is because making these products more secure, like I don't even want to say making secure products because I don't know if we can even do that. But um, making more secure products uh, costs more money, of course, right? You need more people, you need more resources, uh, you need more time. So all these things are, are uh, you know, they cost. And uh, that's fine. But the worst thing is that you can't measure the security of a product. So, you know, I, it would be fine if, like, I had to choose between two, say, document viewers or, or spreadsheet applications or something. And I could look, and one was a security of nine, and one was a security of five or something, by whatever that means. If I could, and the one that, co that was a nine cost twice as much as one that was a five. Well, these are numbers I can think about and assess, like, Hmm, is it really worth it to me to pay that much more for a product that is a, you know, a nine instead of a five on security? And I can make decisions. And some people who are really concerned about security would buy the one that was more expensive. And some people who didn't care so much about security would buy the cheaper one. Um, that would, that would like, work things out eventually, right? Because uh, you know, the people who had, had the expensive one, like, they would make money and they could, they could make their secure product and everyone would be happy who cared about security. And other people would have this cheap product and they might get broken into, but that was okay because they didn't care so much about security. They cared more about you know, cheap things. Um, but we can't do that, right? So right now, if I take two you know, spreadsheet programs, how can you tell which one is the more secure one? How can you tell who spent more money on making it secure? Uh, you can't, right? Even I can't. Um, as a like, professional security researcher, it would take me like, a long, long time to figure out if, if OpenOffice or Excel was better, like more secure. And um, even then, I, don't, I wouldn't be 100% confident. So we can't tell. And so that, that is the incentive for a company to say, like, well, no one's going to tell. Or, you know, no one can tell how much I put into this product, so I'm just not going to put hardly any work into it. Right? Why, why would you not do that? It doesn't make sense. Why would I spend all this money? No, none of my customers are even going to know. So I'll just patch it when there's bugs. So I mean, this is basically the, the, the crux of why I think we're in such bad shape. And then, of course, there's this defender's dilemma, which I've now encountered as someone who's worked you know, on the defensive side, is that uh, as an attacker, which is what I've spent most of my life doing, like you just have to look around, find a bug, you get in, you're done. As a defender, it's like, well, uh, I need to make sure there's no bugs. And that's, that's you know, immensely harder than, than making sure that you, you can't just find a bug. Right? All right, so this is more sort of about like, what you do for a living. So you, you build a system. You, you go and you, you, you buy all this expensive IPSs and you, know, you have all this great products that, that you know, your vendors have given you or, or sold to you, excuse me. And um, you, know, you have all of your, 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 your computers that have antivirus and all this kind of stuff. Like you're totally locked down. Everything is great. Um, you've done everything right. All your systems are, up, are patched. Your, your users are trained you know, not to click on phishing links. Everything is great. And then what happens? Uh, there's a zero day. Okay, so this is, and I'll talk more about this, but, but what are you going to do? So your IPS, it, it doesn't know what this is. Uh, you know, your antivirus doesn't know what this is. Um, but it still affects you. And even, so even in a perfect situation, if your attacker is that sophisticated, you're kind of screwed. And then they move from there, and it turns out that that user has access to, like, some database. And, and that just looks like normal traffic. And before you know it, you've lost, and, and you did everything right, which is, uh, you know, pretty... Pretty, pretty disappointing. Again, because like, what about the company that didn't do everything right? Well, they would have lost to a, to, to a weaker attacker, but they still would have lost. And the reason is because no matter how much security products you buy, all of your users are still using insecure products. So they're all still using you know, maybe Chrome, but probably Internet Explorer. They're all still using you know, Word. They're all still using Adobe Reader. They're all still using all these things on their, on their laptops or their desktops or whatever that you know, have had a history of having problems, and that history is going to go on more or less forever. Um, so, so this is, I, I talked about, like, we can't find the bugs, and this is sort of a defender's dilemma thing, too. Is, uh, so I, I do this thing called fuzzing to find bugs, and you just, 
you, know, you just hammer on an application with different inputs until it falls over and then you, you, you may have found a security problem. And as an attacker, uh, I was often asked, like, well, when do you, how do you know when you're done, right? How do you know that uh, you fuzzed enough? And as an attacker, I was like, well, I know I fuzzed enough when I found a bug, right? Because that's all I need is I need one bug. I can give a talk about it, or I can write a paper about it, or I can you know, write an exploit, or whatever I, I, I care to do. Um, but now that I work for a company where I care about you know, finding all the bugs, right? It's a lot harder question. Now when do I turn off the fuzzer? And um, like, I don't necessarily know. Um, but here is what Microsoft says. So this is in Microsoft's uh, software development lifecycle um, document. So they say, um, so this is when to turn off their fuzzer. So they say, uh, uh, let's see, uh, read you the important part. Um, a minimum of 500,000 iterations and have fuzzed at least 250,000 iterations since the last bug found fix that meets the S <coughs> SDL bug bar. Or for Xbox, 100,000 bug free iterations. That means they just draw a ran like a number, a line in the sand, and they're like, we fuzz till we hit this number and we stop. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that, but now that, because what happens if the 250,000th and one test case would have found a bug? Right, um, but now that I'm I'm sort of on their side of things, I kind of get why they do that. Right, it's like, what else are you going to do? Right, how do you know when you've tested your product enough before you ship it? So they have this, this sort of arbitrary way to do it, um, but uh, and I have some ideas on how to do it too. But it's it's hard. Right, it's hard to make secure software. No one we don't know how to do it, or else we'd be in a lot better shape. So I mentioned um, like zero days, and I'll talk a little bit more about those. Uh, so. So most organizations that are, that are attacked probably are not attacked with zero days. They're attacked with like phishing or you know, exploits that are a year old or, or all this other kind of stuff because we can't even do the basics. But for those organizations that are actually like pretty secure, hopefully a lot of you guys, since you're here, you care enough about security to, to be here, um, you probably make sure your systems are patched and, and that your, your users are um, somewhat smart. Um, uh, I mean, that's another thing. I don't even have slides about this, but I was just thinking about this earlier. Um, so there's this big thing about, oh, we want to make sure we train our users to, to not click on phishing links and know the difference between uh, you know, a, a, a good executable that they download and a bad one or something. And to me, that, like, this doesn't make sense. So like, we're the professionals, right? Like, these other people, they're teaching classes, they're, they're making products, whatever they do, they're not security professionals. They have better things to worry about. If, if, all of our, if the security of our enterprise depends on them making good choices on what link, links to click, like, we're screwed. Like, this is not what we need. Like, we do not need to make sure that our users are perfect because they're not. You know, it's, it's 3 a.m., they've been up all night, and they get an email. Like, there's no way we can trust them to click the right thing. So uh, it's not that they're dumb. It's just that, that that's not their job, and it's our job, right? It's our job to protect them from, from making mistakes. So to rely on user training, I think, is a huge mistake. Like, we need to build systems and networks and enterprises that are resilient to users that are clicking on random stuff. Um, anyway, that was, a, that was an aside. OK, so, so anyway, uh, back to the zero day stuff. So no matter how, so zero days are basically the, the weapon of, of like the, the very good attacker that hopefully a lot of us don't ever have to deal with. But it's there, and we need to think about that and how that affects us as defenders. Um, so, like, just in general, if you, if, just so we're all on the same page, I guess, since we probably all at least know what this word is. So, zero day is uh, a, an exploit, a vulnerability maybe, but, but for our, what we care about is the exploit that, that exists against a product. No one knows about it. There's no way you can have, uh, you can easily have, like, signatures for it, for example, since it's unknown. You can't, get, you can't have a patch for it because it's unknown. So, you'd be fully patched, fully up to date, and you can still get attacked by it. And so it used to be, you know, when I used to talk about this stuff years ago, like people didn't even necessarily believe these existed. Now I think we know that, that, that they at least exist. But the bigger question is, how do you protect yourself against them? And, and you know, why, why do they exist? And, and can we somehow as a group make sure they, that they're not around? So that's kind of the stuff that, that I want to talk about for at least a minute. So um, basically, uh, you know, the, what they're used for is to attack targets that are very hard. So like say you want to attack, you know, you, you, as an attacker, you know, I've tried phishing them. It didn't work. They had some IDS that stopped my, my binary or something. I don't know. Um, I've tried to attack them with some Metasploit module. It didn't work. 
it's like, well, now what am I going to do? It's like, well, I'll attack them with something that they can't necessarily defend very easily against, like a zero day. And you know, of course, zero days aren't always bad, right? If if you're in the matrix or you, you want to take down an alien spacecraft, like zero days, your 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 weapon of choice. But there's there's not that many cases where they can be used for good, but it is possible. All right, so who does use them besides uh, Jeff Goldblum? Uh, so some penetration testers, the very good ones, will use these. Uh, of course, bad guys use them to do bad things. Um, maybe corporations, I hope not. And uh, so it used to be governments, question mark, and now it's governments, period, right? So we, we know that governments use these as well. And then here's just some funny quotes that have, like, from our community of, of InfoSec people that, that uh, about zero days. Um, so this, this woman, uh, Raven is, is uh, her, what she goes by. So she says, zero day can happen to anyone. So this happened, which is totally true, by the way. Um, so she was giving a, conf or a talk like me at a conference like this, um, and someone broke into her, her computer while she was talking and like, did something ridiculous with it. And, uh, and that, this is what she had to say afterwards. Like, well, that can happen to anyone. And everyone really, really like, gave her the business for this. Like, like, oh, you can't even secure your own computer, and I can't believe that you're giving a talk at a security conference. And it's like, no, she's totally right. Like, she was years ahead of what other people were thinking. Is that like, listen, I did everything right, and I, you know, what am I supposed to do against an attack that, that you know, can't be helped? So anyway, so, so that was something I thought was funny. And then this is a guy, Dave Itell. He runs a, um, a company called Immunity. And one of the things he does sometimes is he buys zero-day exploits from people. Um, you know, to use in his products or to use as a, as a penetration tester. And with regards to like, you know, zero day is only zero day until someone tells it. It's like a secret, right? If someone tells you, tells the secret to everyone, it's not a, it's not a secret anymore. So this is his quote is, sometimes we get burned, sometimes not. So sometimes the person sells it to him and then tells everyone, and sometimes they don't. And then here's a quote by me um, when I had a little more hair. I say, uh, like all good researchers, I sat on the issue. So um, I'm talking about like I had found a bug and um, instead of immediately reporting it, I just waited a little bit, and then I reported it at this contest and, and won, won a computer. So uh, again, there's like where you have to think about like where are the incentives for people who find bugs? Where are the incentives to look for bugs? Where are the incentives for people who find bugs to report bugs? Right? And here the incentive for me was to wait and win a computer. When <laughs> if, if there would have been a different kind of incentive to report the bug immediately, people would have been better off. But at least I reported it. Okay, so um, what do we know about zero days? <clears throat> well, I, I, we know like a few examples, and, and there's a little bit of data on it, but not much. Um, this is one that, uh, so there, there's one exploit that uh, I found and I sold, and uh, you know, this happens, right? So, so let's talk about it, and, and like how can we make a system where this may or may not happen again in the future. So, so this happened in 2005, it was a while ago. I found a bug uh, that allowed like remote root access to Linux systems that ran a service called Samba, which some of you may or may not. It's a service that lets Linux boxes talk to Windows boxes. Um, so anyway, uh, I found it. I called it the baby bug because I found it when my, my first child was born, and uh, while he was, I was on like paternity leave, and he was napping, so I just looked for bugs and found it. <laughs> so uh, I sold it to the government, um, and uh, two th in August 2006. Uh, and then someone else found it in 2007 and reported it to ZDI, which is this, this company that makes, uh, uh, they're, they're associated with Tipping Point and makes IDS systems. And so you can, you can report it to the, this company and they'll pay you some money and then they'll report it to the vendor as well. So, uh, so, so think about this. So this was a zero day that, that on many, you know, say university systems, would give you remote root. Um, so it was, it was unknown, it was unfixed, I should say. Like, I knew about it, a couple other people knew about it. There might have been a lot of people, I don't know. Um, two years that, that no one knew about it. Um, the people that I sold it to, who happened to be uh, the U.S. government, um, they had it for 10 months. And so it's like, well, what'd they do with it? I don't know, I can, I can take a pretty good guess what they did with it, but I don't know for sure. All right, so, so, so that's supposed to give you sort of a time frame on how long these things last. And, and why they're a problem, right? So here's another one. This one, again, is kind of old, but it's, it's one of the few that we have an actual timeline on knowing how, how, how it lasted. So this was a bug, uh, an exploit against Adobe Reader. Um, so it, it was discovered, we don't know for sure, by, it was by, by some bad guy. Um, in 2008, he sold it in 2009. 
we, uh, we meaning Adobe, right, uh, saw exploitation happening in January of, of that month. Uh, it was discussed on, in various like vendor mailing lists in February. A patch was available in March. So here you can tell that the, the time from that this attacker could use this weapon against users was somewhere between you know, three months and up. Maybe, maybe a lot more. We don't know for sure. Oh, which is what I just said here. So, um, and, and the worst case is that once they start talking about it in February, like at that point, it's essentially not a secret anymore, right? Um, but as a user, you can't patch it. There might be some 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 signatures or something for it, but at that point, there's no patch, but the information's out there. So there's going to be exploits. There's going to be, you know, there, there's the bad guys and the good guys are sort of fighting to see who can who can can you make a signature before you can make an exploit or vice versa. So. That's even worse, really, because uh, it, it's, it's out there. So here's maybe the last bit of data that, that we know about Zero Day. Again, this is someone who, she, Justine, I tell, she used to be CEO of Immunity. She's not anymore. Um, so she, from their experience of buying Zero Days and, and using them and so forth, um, she says that the average lifespan of a Zero Day is, is just under a year. So that's a long time for a bug to be between a bug being found by them, and maybe it's found by other people, too and being uh, patched. Uh, so the shortest ones that they had were about you know, three months or so. <laughs> the longest one was almost three years. So there was, there was some, some exploit that they had that worked for three years um, without a patch or a way to really easily detect it. And then I mentioned this company, ZDI, uh, that, that you, can, you can give them vulnerability information, they'll pay you a little bit of money, and they will then start to, the process of getting it fixed. And so you can go to their website and see which ones they know about, but they haven't told, any, told the public about yet, but they've told the vendor, and they're waiting for the vendor to fix it. So you can see here, if you can read the fine print, it's, this is like a huge list of, of bugs, and they're all, like I can barely read it, but um, in fact I can't. But uh, they're all, let's just say it's a long list of bugs, and uh, they're not getting fixed anytime soon. So, so there's a lot of known zero days out there, right? Um, and, and what do we do about that, right? Uh, it's, it's, again, like, hopefully that's not a problem we actually have. Like, we, we, most of us, our organizations can't even keep out, like, the unsophisticated attacker. Um, it's only the, like, really sophisticated attacker that's even going to have zero days. And so you have to sort of make a decision on who your enemy is. Like, who are you defending against? Like, are you defending against, you know, uh, the, the teenagers? Are you defending against... You know the like super sophisticated cyber criminals. Are you defending against the NSA, right? And and based on your who you think your your target who's targeting you is how you know how to sort of defend yourself, right? And um, so if you, if you don't care about the NSA, you only care about like keeping things sort of safe from like teenagers or rogue students or something, then you you know you can do something a lot different. Really necessarily have to worry about that. All right. So I already mentioned that sort of the reason that all of our security is is not so hot is because of that we use these products and, and they're not that great. <clears throat> so, um, so what do we do? Who's to blame? Um, I already mentioned that that uh, vulnerabilities are, are essentially, you know, the, the the root problem. Vulnerabilities in products, and I already mentioned that vendors have a big incentive to sort of get products out the door, and and adding security is is adds an extra extra cost, and there's no sort of measurable benefit to, to consumers. So um, I already mentioned this, that, you know, if, if, I'm a, if I want to, to shop online for books, say, and I want to use the, the site that's a little more, that's the most secure website, because I, I don't want my stuff to get, you know, my credit card information to be lost, um, and I'm willing to pay a little more for that, right? I'll go to the more expensive website if it's more secure. How can I know that that's the case, say, between Borders and Amazon? There's no way to know that, right? You know, they, they each had the little secured by McAfee symbol. Okay, you know, great. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so you can't, as a consumer, you can't make decisions based on which products or websites are more secure, and so you can't affect the amount of money that, that companies are, are spending. And the other thing is, like, suppose, you know, a company makes a, a, a product and it has a problem and it leads to a breach, um, does that product? Does that company even suffer, right? So, like, if if 
like this Target CEO, like he, he, he got fired, so maybe that's good. Um, but then again, I heard something about he was doing some really other crazy stuff too. So, but what about like how did that breach happen, right? What was the underlying cause? What was the vulnerability, right? So, uh, you know, was did, did FireEye screw up? You know, was there was was it a, a person who screwed up, or was it a product that screwed up? Like, what was the what was the root cause, right? And what company is to blame for that root cause, and did that company suffer? And um, my, my limited research shows that companies don't ever really suffer from, from making insecure products. Like maybe the, the, the company like Target, in this case, that used the insecure product, they might suffer, their stock might go down. But the company that, that gave them the product that, that led to the, to the to breach didn't actually suffer much, I bet. So here's, here's a one. I, I wrote this iPhone ex exploit in 2010, which was like super awesome. Like I could just send you a text and take over your phone. And it was, it was uh, like a big deal. And, to me, at least, and uh, it was like, okay, I bet you Apple, Apple's going to really suffer. People are going to stop buying iPhones because it's like, holy cow, people can just attack me, right? And so you can look at their stock. Like that's that's essentially what Apple cares about. Like Apple suffers if their stock goes down. So you look in their stock. That's the day that I announced that it was in the newspapers and all this stuff. The stock did not go down. In fact, it went up a little bit. So I guess that just proves that there's no such thing as bad advertising or bad publicity. All right, so maybe that's just Apple. Apple's like the freak of, of Wall Street, right? So how about Microsoft? So when the Nimda worm came out, which was like a pretty big deal, like everyone's computers were shutting down for you know, days at a time and all this stuff. That happened uh, back in 2001, September 18th. It's, it happened right there. On, you know, that's the, the Microsoft stock. Um, again, stock actually went up when that happened. So if, you know, you don't know, like the stock market, maybe everything went up, but still, like, definitely they didn't suffer much because uh, they had produced a product that caused a lot of us, IT people, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, late nights. So, you know, if, if there's no reason not to, if, if there's no incentive to make secure products, why, why, why do companies do it? Well, the answer is they don't really do it. So, um, the you know, the only thing you can do is uh, as, and, and so basically you need to realize that, that all of your products that you're going to be using aren't very secure, and you need to sort of try to design your network or your defense around that fact. Like, okay, I give up, this, this computer's going to get taken over at some point because they're using, you know, Office or, or whatever. And so, but I'm going to make sure that then bad guys can't exfiltrate data or bad guys can't you know, attack other systems nearby or, or whatever. So there's still things you can do even, but you just have to take as your starting premise that, you know, the, the products that you're going to use aren't, aren't so good. And again, you're not going to be able to keep out everybody. So the best you can hope to do is keep out the people you care about. So um, if you care about teenagers or you care about, you know, cyber criminals or whatever, just try to make your defense to where they, they move on to the next target. Right? So there's, there's a lot of universities, and if your university is one of the best, the most secure, then hopefully, uh, if they're not targeting you specifically, they'll move on to an easier one to attack. And then this, this final note is just like, if, if, you're, if your enemy is the government, which, uh, you know, like for example, some, if, you're, if you're the White House or you're, uh, I don't know, maybe Stanford, I don't know. But if, if, if you care about the Chinese government, like you're basically going to lose that battle because no matter what you do, no matter how much money you spend on defense, no matter how secure you make your products, the government's going to outspend you. And this is just a quote there that says, like, um, countries spend billions of dollars to create new arm, to create new armies and stockpiles of digital weapons. So, like, you can't outspend them. They're going to win that battle. So, what you know, maybe the government will save us from our insecure products. Um, right now, there's no laws that say products should be secure. We can't even measure the security of products. Um, we're not going to really be able to make laws very easily, I don't think, because it'll be us, people in this room, versus uh, companies like Microsoft and Apple that, that have a lot of money to spend. Um, and there's no way, there's no, right now, there's no sort of system to, to even make this happen. So, like, for my toaster, there's a, there's a group called Underrise Laboratory that makes sure that it's safe, right? That I can plug it in and not worry about it catching fire. But there's no such thing for the security of, of software. So like, it would be awesome if there was, right? It's like, well, we could release you know, Adobe Reader, but it didn't pass the, the UL test, so we can't. We're going to have to wait another month and, and get it retested. But there's nothing like that. But it would be cool if there was. Like, well, maybe like, the military will save the day, right? Well, they're not going to do that. 
Um, because the problem is exploits and vulnerabilities can be used in both in two ways, right? So there's a vulnerability in a web browser. Attackers can use that to attack you, or you can patch it and become more secure. And, but you can't do both of those things at the same time. And so the government sort of wants to keep, they, they want to do both of those, and they're never going to probably, they're going to make sure they have plenty of weapons before they start to, to patch things. So, so they're not going to really help. And then finally, it's like, well, you know, the, maybe the, the reporters of the world will help us to, to see, see the light. And um, they are not necessarily doing that either. Um, so, so reporters, like everyone else, they're, 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 they, they're uh, trying to do the best they can. Um, but what, what motivates them is selling newspapers, right? It's not necessarily saving the internet from attackers, which is maybe ours. Um, it's, it's getting page clicks. And uh, if they want to write a bunch of stories, in-depth, you know, uh, investigative journalism on how compliance doesn't work or how, uh, how great the new application sandbox is or how, you know, we've really spent a lot on securing our architecture at our, you know, company. I mean, those stories are boring. I wouldn't read those. So they're definitely not going to write those, those stories. They're going to write stories about, like, the, the latest, greatest new attack and, um, you know, like, like the ones I said about, like, your TV's watching you, right? So, you know, whether my TV is watching me, like, that's sort of, like, scary and creepy, but it doesn't really affect me protecting an enterprise or university, right? Like, the, the biggest threat of, of, you know, UMSL getting broken into isn't that the TVs are going to start watching the students, right? Like, that's the last thing they need to worry about. Um, but that's the thing that, they're, that they might start worrying about if they're just only reading newspapers and using that to guide them. These other ones on here, a lot of them are about mobile tax. Because I've spent a lot of time doing mobile tax. Mobile tax get like huge press, but really they're not something, they're, they're a distraction. Um, if you look at all the breaches, like none of them are caused by mobile tax. They're always caused by desktop stuff. So it's like everyone's so scared about mobile, but it's not really what we should be focusing on. And then, uh, like, I'm as guilty as anybody. Like, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, as you saw in this talk, like, I'm not, I, I try to be good, and I try to do the right thing, and I try to help out, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not the, the superhero of the Internet, right? So I, I still just have to make decisions like everyone else. So, so, like, the reason, there's this thing called stunt hacking. I don't know. So uh, if you read, and in, in this, this was, like, in some magazine, and I, it says under me for my accomplishment, it says, World's best stunt hacker. So, so what is stunt hacking? Stunt hacking is, is like showing exploits or doing something that's like, wow, gee whiz, you know, but, but really has no effect on actual security, right? And so, so an example of that is, is the thing about, you know, TVs watching you. Um, I would say a lot of mobile security is actually that. But like hacking cars is a great example of that, right? So like... Again, if, if you're trying to defend your enterprise, the fact that maybe one of your, your you know, employees' car gets hacked is really, really should be at the very bottom of your, you know, your threats that you're concerned about. Um, and yet, this is the thing that everyone wants to talk about, right? It's like, well, you guys are just like talking about the wrong things, you know? Um, so here's more, here's more examples of stunt hacking, and um, sadly, like, I'm to blame for some of those. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, it's fun. And so the point is that, like, while everyone's over here looking at the, like, wow, look at this new article. Wow, did you hear about that latest attack? Like, the real problem is, like, the same old stuff we can't even do right in the first place. And so, um, so st 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 stunt hacking is, is, like, something that distracts us from real threats. And, and try not to get so distracted. All right. I know lunch is coming, so I'll try to wrap this up quickly. Uh, because I'm hungry too. Um, so, so, and if you haven't figured it out from that, that's not, that was like, it's like, well, that's, you know, I'm blaming, that was in the section of the talk blaming newspaper reporters or, you know, and, and obviously I'm to blame as well. And so researchers are not, are not really helping that much either, including myself. So like, I report bugs and they get fixed, but still it doesn't really, it hasn't really improved internet security. Um, so, so why is that? Well, it used to be that, that report, our researchers did stuff just for like, you know, to show up to their friends and stuff. Um, but, but things are sort of changing. So now people are, researchers want, you know, money. And so they want to sell exploits and they want to, uh, you know, do the thing, they want to, you know, get newspapers or whatever motivates them. But it's not necessarily about, you know, 
it, it's, it's serious business now, right? Um, so, so when someone like me finds a bug, they have to ask themselves, what am I going to do with it? Well, I could tell Microsoft if I want to pick on them, and they'll, they'll give me my name in a, in, you know, a patch. Cool. Uh, I, can, I, can tell, I can sell the ZDI for $5,000. Well, that's kind of nice. I did the right thing, and I got some money. Or I can sell it to like, the US government, who like, in some sense is not a bad guy, but kind of is. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, some people would justify that in saying that's the right thing to do anyway. But I, I, I probably wouldn't. But anyway, the, it's $100,000, right? So it's like, well, it's kind of hard to, you know, a, a, to blame someone for choosing that last thing, even though that doesn't help us, right? And, and it's even worse if you're like some kid somewhere, right? Like I might make a responsible choice even though it costs me money. Um, you, I, or I might not, but like some, you can't really blame some kid for making the wrong choice. And, and definitely, the security of the internet shouldn't depend on whether these people make the right choice or not, right? It should be secure, no matter what. So finally, I just want to wrap up with like some good things that have happened in the last seven years. So, so far it's been a, like a real bummer, I think, this talk. <laughs> um, but there's, there is sort of some, some good news coming down, down, down the, the road here. So, like Heartbleed, I thought was like a really good thing. So uh, it was bad in the sense that, that it showed yet another internet disaster. But there was like a lot of good that came out of it. One was uh, there was a lot of press about it. Like I was like, it's on NPR and stuff. It's like really like Kai Rizdal was talking about Open SSL. It's like <laughs> what world do I live in, you know? But so that was good. It got like major coverage, um, and it and it wasn't just like oh, there's this thing, and now the hackers have us, you know? It was like there were some like serious issues being talked about, like. You know, everyone uses OpenSSL. Is this a problem? Like, OpenSSL isn't funded. Like, is this a problem? Like, this is open source. Should we use open source? You know, does open source work? And there was like some serious like things being talked about. I was like, this is great. Like, so that was a, that was a good positive thing. It wasn't just the same old like the hackers won. Oh my God, all our credit cards are gone. What are we gonna do? Oh, well, there was some of that, but there was some like really good positive stuff. All right. Uh, so despite what I said about how bad procs are, the security procs have actually improved a lot. Um, there's fewer bugs, like Adobe Reader, which used to be a nightmare, now is in a sandbox, and it's not that bad. Um, there's, iOS is like pretty secure, it has code signing, and then there's tons of things that make writing exploits hard, which was smart. Like, we gave up on trying to uh, find all the bugs, because we don't know how to do that. And we started doing something we can do, which is engineering. So we tried to engineer things to make it hard to write exploits. Like, we give up on the bugs, but we're going to make it hard on you to write exploits. And that's, that's smart. And, and now, basically, all products have that. So, so then why do we still have breaches, and why does someone still win Pwn Known every year? Um, the reason is that the products are more secure. We can't really measure that they are, but, but from my personal experience of trying to find bugs in them, I'll say they are. Um, but what happens is we reduce the number of people who can write exploits, but there's still people who can do it. So, it, so it's hard to tell if you look at Pwn Known. So like, this is my made-up graph of number of capable exploit writers in the world. Um, and so like, it used to be like anyone could do it. Like, you know, my seven-year-old could do it. But now, it's like you, only a few people in the world can do it. And that's better. But it's kind of hard to tell because there's still people who can do it, right? Um, other things is, so here's my shout out to our sponsor, Symantec. Um, so so this is, I saw this in the newspaper yesterday. This is like smart, right? So Symantec is basically saying antivirus doesn't work. I, I, I totally agree. Um, but uh, there's some people coughing. Yeah, yeah Symantec. Uh, so anyway, uh, I, I totally agree. This is smart thinking. We need to think beyond that. It's like, this is broken. We, everyone has known it's broken for 10 years. So why don't we move on and do something better? So that, that's smart thinking. Um, we're paying researchers now, which is smart. Uh, I mean, that motivates people. So there was this program called Cyber Fast Track, which I participated in. That funded my NFC research and my car research, which was sort of stunt hacky, but still, uh, it gave me, you know, money to do research I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So, uh, even though cars aren't really a huge threat, it's still like a good idea to at least consider the threat. So it was good that that, that, that money was coming from the government to researchers like me. Um, unfortunately, now they, they, they've shut down that program. Um, it, was, it, was, it was meant to shut down, it wasn't necessarily because they saw like car hacking and was like, oh my god, what are we doing? Uh, it was it was a design shutdown, but still it's a bummer. Um, also, the bug bounties like are, have been around for a while, but they're getting better. So it used to so bug bounties definitely work. Like here's a graph if you can see it 
of Google, the, the number of bugs that re were reported to them. So at first, it was like a few. And as soon as they started paying, it went up and it stayed up. Um, so they, and it says they fixed over 2,000 security bugs from, from bug bounty, um, bug reports. That's 2,000 less bugs that are in things like Chrome that, that we all use and depend on. Um, the, the problem is that uh, it used to be bug bounties were like $1,000, and like, that's a lot of money for some people, but it's not a lot of money for the amount of work it takes, I don't think. Um, but it's going up, and that's the positive thing to take away from bug money. So now, like, Microsoft paid $100,000. Like, that's a lot of money. Like, I would get out of bed to do that. <laughs> but, and like, they, you know, 11000 for a bug in Internet Explorer they would pay. Google's paying up to $7,500. Chrome, 5000 Like, that's some serious money. Like, this guy, who's, whose hacker name is Rainforest Puppy, um, he won $100,000 from Microsoft. Like, that's serious money. Like, people would definitely do that. And, like, the Ponome prizes as well have gone up. Uh, of course, the four years I won uh, were when they were way, way on the bottom. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, it's good. So it's, it, it's an indication not only that it's harder to hack into computers, so you have to pay more. It's like a supply and demand thing. But also that that's going to motivate people to look for these last few uh, bugs that, that maybe are in these products. Uh, another thing that's happened recently that I think is like a really cool idea is this whole crowdsourcing of, of, of security. So um, TrueCrypt is a full disk encryption. A bunch, 1,300 people donated to, to a fund that is going to be used to pay to have a professional audit done in that code. Um, they raised $53,000. They hired a consulting company called ISAC Partners for uh, five to six weeks of engagement. And it's going on right now. You can download the report that they wrote. And then, uh, so there some, after the heart bleed, some people were trying to, to raise money to audit OpenSSL. They're not doing quite as well, but still. So I think that's a good idea. Like, we need to, you know, put our money where our mouths are. So, uh, wrapping things up, uh, basically, um, you know, we're not doing that hot, right? Like, for all we talk about, we still get hacked. Like, a lot of the talks at this conference are about, like, you know, yo, we totally got hacked, and here's what happened. Um, which is cool because we would need to learn from these, but at the same time, like, let's not get hacked anymore, right? Let's do better. Like, I don't understand why, you know, a bunch of us smart people have been in this field for so long and we're still not any better than we really were. Um, so, uh, and the other thing, like, that, I, that hopefully you'll, you'll take away from this is, like, we're only as safe as the products we use, or at least we need to realize that we use insecure products and design our, our, our security around that fact. Um, it's not, and even if you b believe everything I said here, um, and even if Google and Microsoft believed everything I said here, uh, and they said, we're gonna, you're right, Charlie, we're gonna make our product secure, that's not gonna happen this year or next year. Like, this is, that, I mean, we, we don't know how to do it. It's gonna be years and years before we would feel confident. Um, so plan, right, plan on, on what to do. And then finally, like, there are some things that are improving, some things that are, that are better than it used to be. Uh, so, so, so we just need to keep thinking about those things and, and pushing people to, to keep doing that. So anyway, that's it. Thanks, everyone. So I know you guys want to go to lunch. Uh, like, definitely feel free to just take off and go to lunch. I won't be offended. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you, can, you can step up to a microphone uh, or ask. I'll also be doing this this online thing later where there's questions too, so if you have questions, you can grab me there too. But um, anyway, any questions, anyone? There's a question. So we have a question from an online audience member. Um, what is, what do you think we need to do to get people talking about the right thing and doing the right thing with re respect to reporting bugs? Okay, so um, the question is about how do we make people report bugs the right way. Um, so. I think that uh, you, need, you need, I mean, I, I mentioned like, you know, there's incentives, right? So you can report a bug for, and, and you know, and get your name in a, in a patch release or something, and, and that can be good. That can help you get hired. You can put that on your resume. Um, you can report to like ZDI and, and you get a little bit of money, or you can, you can do something, sell it to someone, either a bad guy or, you know, the government or whoever else would want to use it, and then you get a lot more money. So for me, I think, like, it's hard to argue against someone who wants to get, get, like, 20 times as much money for doing, you know, what doesn't help people for what does, right? Like, it's like, well, you know, I kind of see why you did that. But if, if it was, like, 
you know, maybe just a little bit. Like, you're never going to be outspending the government. The government is always going to be able to pay more than ZDI or Microsoft or anything like that. But if you can at least get it close, um, so it's like, well, I could have gotten $50,000 for reporting it to Microsoft or, you know, 70000 for giving it to the government and not telling anyone. Well, then it's like, well, most people, I think, would probably, you know, do, quote, unquote, the right thing, right? Um, so, so I think if you, just, if you can just make the incentives more aligned towards doing the right thing uh, and not make it such a hard decision, you know, we, then I think we're better off. Yeah? question is, was I banned from using iTunes? No, I can use iTunes right now. Uh, the thing I can't do is make apps. So, uh, <laughs> right, so the story there is I found a vulnerability in, um, in the way that apps on an iPhone work. So uh, right now, apps, they can't download new code. They can't update themselves. They can't do anything new. Everything they do has to have been approved by Apple. But I found a way they could. They could download new code and run it without Apple having ever seen it. And, um, you know, being from Missouri, the show me state, I decided that the only way that anyone's going to believe this is if I actually do it, right? So, because I knew if I didn't, Apple would be like, oh, well, that's fine and good, but when you submit this app, I, we would have totally caught it. So I was like, well, I'll just submit it and see if they catch it. <laughs> so I submitted it, and the app could download new code and run it, um, and uh, I submitted it, it passed, and uh, I told them about the bug after that, um, but I didn't tell them I had submitted the app. And the app never downloaded any, like people did actually download the app, but it never downloaded any new code or anything. Like that. It didn't hurt anyone. Um, but uh, when they found out about it, uh, they got pretty upset. And um, <laughs> the funny thing is that they found out about it by reading an article in Forbes about it. And uh, so I was like out running, I was jogging, and my wife was like, frantic when I got home. She's like, Apple keeps calling. I was like, what? <laughs> I had no idea that like, the article had even been published yet. And I was like, what do you mean Apple's calling me? So uh, like, that, that never happens. And it hasn't ever happened except that one day. So anyway, it turned out they were really mad. Um, they said it was like you know, malware or whatever. It, it had the capabilities of malware, but it didn't ever do anything bad. They, they banned me from, from the developer program, which meant I couldn't write apps anymore, which is fine because I'm not a developer. But they, it also meant I couldn't get the beta releases of, for Apple products, which is kind of a bummer because I find a lot of Apple bugs and report them to Apple. Um, but anyway, uh, it was for a year, um, at least a year. So a year came by, and I wrote them an email, and I was like, hey, it's me, Charlie Miller. Uh, <laughs> my year is up. Like, can I get back in the program? And they never sent me an email back. So <laughs> that's, that's that story. I'm also uh, uh, banned from using uh, Google as well. Even though I've, I've never actually published an app for, for Google, uh, but I'm still banned. For life, actually. A lifetime ban. They'll still take your data. Oh, they're happy. To, my, they love my data. They suck it down, but they, I, I can't make an app for them, for the Play Store. All right, well, I think that's about it. If you have any other questions, just like hang around and I, I can talk to you. Thanks again.